Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Jewish Museum Milwaukee Conversation Starter. We are so thrilled to have today's guest with us today, Daniel Sawyer, who I'm going to give a little bit of background on. But we are doing this in connection with our current exhibit, um, Brother Can You Spare a Dime? Jewish Artists of the WPA. And there are really three uh, siblings brothers from the Sawyer family that were all WPA artists, very noted. And one of those uh, was Moses Sawyer, who is Daniel's grandfather. So we are, as I said, just so honored and thrilled to have you here with us today to talk a bit about your grandfather and your great uncles. So uh, before we kind of launch in, I want to give a little bit of a background and I want to say this is a very abbreviated biography. Um, Daniel has done so much academically, it is incredibly impressive, but uh, he's a professor of history at Fordham University in New York. Among his books, with also our good friend Annie Pollan, uh, The Emerging Metropolis, New York Jews in the Age of Immigration, 1840 to 1920, Volume 2 of City of Promises, A History of the Jews of New York, and that was put out by NYU Press in 2012. He's a winner of a National Jewish Book Award, and he edited the Jewish Metropolis, New York City from the 17th to the 21st century. That was put out by Academic Studies Press in 2021. And as we just said, he is the grandson of Moses Sawyer and grand nephew of Raphael and Isaac Sawyer, all WPA artists. So welcome, Daniel. Thank you, thank you for having me. <laughs> So we, I mean, there's so much to talk about. We're going to try and get in as much as we can in our half hour together. Um, just a, a little bit of a you know, background to start us off. We talked about uh, Moses, his twin brother, Raphael, and their younger brother, Isaac, were all successful painters in New York. And uh, actually, we have a quote, as was described by your grandfather in 1939, they all shared a common purpose. Our message is people. The people we paint are the plain people we live and mingle with, people we know and understand best, members of our families, fellow artists, students, dancers, shop girls, workers employed and unemployed. We try to paint them understandingly in their own surroundings and in their natural attitudes. And I, I should point out before we, uh, get into our first question here, um, all were really kind of known as social realist artists. Um, and Moses uh, has been described as unquestionably one of the most important figurative painters of the 20th century. So with that, let's, let's get into our first question. Your grandfather, Moses, and, uh, and your two grand uncles were, as we said, uh, participated in federally funded art program under the auspices of the Works Progress Administration during the Great Depression. They were born in Russia. The brothers were three of six children born to Abraham or Avram and Bela Shoyer. So um, can you tell us a little bit about the family and their background? So, yeah, I mean, I can tell you that. So their father, uh, Avram, as um, everyone in the family to this day calls him, um, was from a rabbinic family. His grandfather and great-grandfather were the rabbis in the shtetl from which he came, which was which was Lutzin, uh, current-day Lutza, Latvia. So he came from a, and there were various um, tributary families that were also rabbinic. Uh, so he came from that kind of background. Um, and Bela, her, she, I believe, was from a, a, a rural area. Her father, her parents kept a, a shank, a, a tavern or an inn, which was a very typical Jewish uh, occupation or business. Um, and they lived for a while in, uh, let's see, in, in, in the shtetl in Latvia. Um, but uh, Avram, um, family lore and his own kind of writings have it confirmed that he was not, he tried to go into business, but he it was not, it was not in his blood. And uh, he lost a, a lot of money and um, mm. he, uh, 
he kept on having to go kind of back into teaching, which is really what he was. He was really a teacher. And they ended up moving uh, to what in Yiddish is called Tif Ruslan, Deep Russia, um, a place called Boris Oglebsk, um, which is south, southeast of Moscow. I mean, really, really deep Russia outside of the Pale of Settlement. People may know that Jews were required to live in the western uh, areas, provinces of, of the Russian Empire, but there were always exceptions, uh, merchant, various merchants, uh, people with certain skills and so on could li get permission to live outside of it. And um, so there were some Jews in Borisoglebsk and they needed a teacher. And so they brought Avram uh, to be their teacher. And that's where uh, Moses and Rayfield uh, grew up until they were 12 years old and the other younger children, so however old they were, uh, when they left. Um, so they, um, so it should be noted that uh, I, I know for a fact that they knew, for example, Yiddish and Hebrew very well. I believe that they probably learned Hebrew with their father, uh, who I can talk a little bit more in a second of Rob. Uh, but they also knew Russian. The two older boys, Raphael and Moses, knew Russian very well and kind of preferred it. They were a little bit of a kind of Russophiles. And uh, you know, by you know, I think after over the, over the decades, they spoke English together, but they sometimes spoke Russian together as well, just you know to do. So um, the thing about Avram, though, is that he he came from a very traditional background. As I said, his uh, his grandfather, great grandfather, were rabbis. His father also had uh, ordination as a rabbi, but was not working as a rabbi, working as a Talmud teacher. Um, but he himself was a bit more modern, and he really had a love for the Hebrew language. Uh, and at some point, I think right before they came to the United States, but even more afterwards, he started to write in Hebrew. Uh, and he became a published Hebrew writer. Um, so, but he was writing modern things like stories and memoirs and things like this, and children's stories. Uh, so this was kind of modern culture. And this is the kind of background they came from, which was very steeped in, um, you know, all, all of these kinds of cultures, uh, kind of uh, Hebrew, Yiddish, uh, Jewish culture of Eastern Europe, but also Russian culture, uh, but very modern all around. And eventually, of course, also American, you know, culture as well. So interesting when you talk about the background and the modernism, particularly because of the environment that Abram was, you know, felt very strongly about providing for his children. Um, he raised his children in an intellectual environment, really putting emphasis on academic and artistic pursuits. What did that entail? So, um, you know, he, he certainly, uh, exposed them, as we said, to cultures and all different languages. Uh, but he also exposed them to art. And again, you know, some of this is family lore. Uh, but on, at some point on the way to visiting family in Lutzin, or maybe it was on their way out of the country when they left, uh, he brought them to Moscow, for example, to the Hermitage, to see the museums, to see drawings. Mm -hmm. He encouraged them to draw. Uh, he actually... Um, there was some competition between them, you know, so like who could draw the best? And I, now I'm forgetting which one was, which one said this. I said about the other one, that the other one drew a better horse and he was just so, you know, the, the other one drew a better horse and so he was just like so jealous and so upset, you know, and he didn't have to draw it. So there was this kind of um, ambition for them and um, that they should be contributing to modern culture. Right. So I was just reading a, um, it's actually just reading kind of memoir uh, by Avram. He wrote in Hebrew um, about how he met, it's a whole other story, how he met Avram Isaac Cook, the future chief rabbi of, uh -huh. of Israel. Uh, but um, the, there's an exchange between, that he records, you know, 50 years later between his mother and his father where his father says, I'm worried about our, our Avram because he's he's reading this modern literature secretly 
He was reading the, the Moskilic, the Jewish Enlightenment literature secretly. I know this. I, saw, I found the books, and he's drawing pictures, and this is not good. But Avram's mother, my my great great grandmother, says says back to him that you drew pictures too, and you used to write things too, you know. So his father was very traditional, uh, but there was this kind of urge in the family to do these things, and Avram. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, was able to start to express the more to encourage his children to do so. Clearly, clearly in the, in the blood, <laughs> I would say. By the way, his daughter is New Hebrew too. So, he, you know, and this is not like a automatic thing in traditional right. Jewish life. So he, he gave his daughters a Hebrew education as well. I know for a fact they could read uh, Hebrew well. That's Amazing. So we talked about, uh, you know, the interests, some of the things they were passionate about. Um, probably some of that was impacted by what was going on in Russia. So the family immigrated to the United States in 1912. What were the circumstances surrounding that? What were some of the, you know, experiences that, that really forced their departure? Well, so they were living outside the Pale of Settlement. They had official permission to do so. Um, but their, uh, again, this is according to family lore, uh, their permission was revoked. Uh, and uh, actually, this is also one short thing I saw about that of Rome wrote to someone. Uh, so I don't know the details, uh, but it, their permission was revoked, and it may have had something to do with Avram being friendly with some of the young people. He wasn't so young anymore, and he had six children, but uh, that he was friendly with some of the younger, kind of more radical mm. youth in town. And maybe he was even keeping some literature for them uh, on his premises. That's what I heard. And so he was not particularly radical. He was a Zionist. He was a uh, Hebraist. He was not like a socialist or anything like that, but uh, he may have been kind of friendly with those circles. And so their permission was revoked. Hmm. And Avram would have, I think, very much liked to go to uh, Palestine. Uh, but someone uh, counseled him that if you have six children uh, at that time in 1912, you don't go to Palestine, you go to America. Hmm. And so they had actually already family in Philadelphia. And, you know, we heard in the last four years, really four and a half years by now, a lot about chain migration. Uh, and how horrible it is, but of course, every every migration is chain migration. And they had family in Philadelphia, so that's where they went. They went to Philadelphia, uh, but they didn't stay very long. And within, I think, months they were in New York. So, in leaving Russia, um, was there was there also uh, you know the influence of anti-Semitism at play? or you know, fear in terms of some of the pogroms, the, the in, you know, increased violence. Was that something that was on Avram's mind as well, do you think? Uh, I really don't know. Okay. I think sometimes in general, uh, the aspect of violence is over overemphasized as a motivation for the mass migration. There were spikes after each wave of pogroms. Remember the pogroms became waves. Yeah. So in between there were fewer, and um, and most people were motivated by economic uh, motivations. Um, this is not to say that there weren't um, self like indirect influences of anti-Semitism. So if you couldn't move around as easily, you couldn't move as easily around the interior of Russia, your mark markets were, were restricted, and so on. Uh, it may have hurt your chances of being able to make a living or moving somewhere else to make a living, and so you might come abroad. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know of any specific um, example of anti-Semitism that uh, prompted that. Okay. Aside from the fact that they didn't have permission to do. Right, right. So we we do know that you know very much at you know the top of Avram's mind in moving to the U.S. was this idea of pursuing religious, intellectual, philosophical uh, freedom. Um, so now that we're kind of segueing to, to the U.S., the family changed or may have not <laughs> changed the surname to Sawyer after arriving. So um, 
can you talk to me a little bit of, about maybe the circumstances surrounding that and, and if that is, is true or not? So our name is Sawyer, as you can see on the screen, S-O-Y-E-R. Um, this is, uh, there's a French name that's spelled this way, but we're not French, this is not a French name. There is a Turkish name that is spelled this way, but we're not Turkish, and this is not a Turkish name. Uh, we are the only people with this name, um, but it's not exactly changed because there are other versions of it. Remember that we're talking about a name used in uh, five different languages in three different alphabets. And so I have seen this in Russian, spelled phonetically like this, Soy, Soyer, Soyer, Soyer. Uh, I've seen it uh, in records of the Joint Distribution Committee. It, it, later, after, well after our branch of the family left, there was a fire in Lutzin in the town, and the JDC gave some aid. And one of the recipients was a Suyer, S-U-J-E-R. It's spelled in Latvian. Uh, I said that in, in Russian. Um, but uh, so there was, and we have relatives in, in Philadelphia. The relatives in Philadelphia spelled it S-U-E-R. Uh, but sometimes that's a way of um, the E or the Y-E, like from Russian to English, can be transliterated in different ways. So this, this was the name, one way or another. But then there's the Hebrew name, uh, which my great-grandfather Avram, as I said, he, he signed his name in Hebrew, Shin Vav Ein Reish, Sha'er. So Sha'ar is gate, Sha'er is someone who keeps the gate, a gatekeeper. And, you know, I saw, I thought, well, maybe that's his pen name. But then I've seen things in Hebrew with other family members who spelled it that way, that were from the much broader family, you know, mm. in Russia before he was writing and so on. So there was a version, that was a version of the name also that was circulating around. So what's interesting about what's seen is that there were several families, interlocking families, with Hebrew last names, which is kind of unusual among Ashkenazi. Um, there was Sho'er, and there was Tzioni, and there was, uh, well, actually kind of Spanish Hebrew, Don Yechia, definitely a rabbinic Sephardic family. That that family definitely is from an old Sephardic rabbinic family that ended up somehow in the northeast corner of the Pale Settlement in Russia. But um, so, you know, uh, we ended up spelling it S-O-Y-E-R, um, in America. I don't know why that either or why it wasn't S-A-W-Y-E-R. I'm kind of glad it wasn't, but uh, <laughs> everyone always confuses it. Um, but I'll tell you another story about names, though, is that so um, one of Abram's sons and one of the artists was Moses Sawyer. So how did he get the name Moses? Well, he was Moshe. He was Moshe Bear. Uh, or as Luke Fox, the probably said Mesha Bear or Mesha Bear. Um, but they came and he went to school and the school said, the teacher said, well, you can't be Moshe, so we'll call you Morris or Maurice, I think it was Maurice, which was very common, right? But his sister, supposedly, his sister was very, well, much younger, but much more kind of on the ball. Mm -hmm. said, no, Moshe is not Maurice, Moshe is Moses. So it has to be Moses and they insisted on that. And so that's how he was Moses in English. So interesting. That's so interesting. And I just want to verify, so because I, I think I've been pronouncing uh, one of the brothers' names incorrectly. So we have Moses, we have Isaac, and is it Raphael? We always called him Raphael. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Inside for all everyone listening. People say Raphael, but it's Raphael. <laughs> Should be and good to be right. Should be right. So once the uh, family was in the United States, as you said, went to Philadelphia, but ultimately settled in New, in New York City. And the brothers went on to study a range of styles and movements uh, at several institutions in the U.S. and abroad. Um, how did that influence their methodologies? Well, so it, it, it very much influenced them. Uh, I think just maybe to some extent, maybe to some extent not, because... Um, well, Moses, for sure, and I believe he brought his brothers with him, started at the Ferrer School, which was a kind of anarchist 
adult education school in East Harlem, uh, named after the famous uh, Spanish um, anarchist uh, educator, uh, Ferrer. Who's the person? Francisco, I think, Ferrer, I'm not sure. Um, but there, there were people like John Sloan, Robert Henry, who were you know, not immigrants, you know, American, American uh, painters, realist painters. Um, and um, they taught these immigrant artists you know, in this school. And I think they had like a big influence that you could go and you could learn these things with these uh, real American artists who painted the real people, you know, uh, the people in the street, like not pretty, like art should not be necessarily pretty, right? It's not about pretty things. It's not about things how you want them to be, or it's not about like propaganda, because like traditionally art is a lot about propaganda, but uh, commissioned, you know, by rich people. But they believe that, that um, art should be about real life, right? And so um, that was their first influence. Now, Moses and Raphael actually split up on purpose. They went to different schools because they were, they were twins, you know, and they didn't want to come out exactly the same. Sure. But frankly, they came out very similar. <laughs> I mean, their styles are very similar, you know, so uh, something is like inborn and something is educated. So Moses, I could tell you, went to the Educational Alliance Art School mm -hmm. uh, on the Lower East Side, uh, very famous for producing all kinds of, you know, artists, uh, you know, many of whom were his, you know, contemporaries. Um, Chaim Gross, who was a lifelong friend, uh, you know, went there supposedly became friends because Chaim came and, you know, he only spoke Yiddish. He said, well, somewhere it says, he said that Moses only really spoke Yiddish. This is like virtually impossible, you know, at the Educational Alliance Art School uh, yeah. in 1920. Yeah. <laughs> it's like impossible. But maybe he was going to talk to him. Talk to him. I don't know. But they became friends. Uh, I, you know, um, I should have looked, you know, confirmed all this Philip Evergood, uh, all of these uh, people. So um, came out came out of this, and so you know they 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 went to different places and uh, and they were further kind of influenced. Uh, now Moses also, and I can talk mostly about you know most most right. about Moses. So Moses also went to Paris because he won a scholarship through this through the Educational Alliance. Um, uh, through, it was either the Ford or the Workman's Circle, people could look this up, uh, through the Educational Alliance Art School. And he went to Paris to study, you know, uh, in, the in the 1920s, in 26 or so to 28. Um, so there, of course, he was, you know, influenced by that scene again. Um, so they had a variety of influences, but always their idea was, you know, that they were going, like you, you read at the beginning, that they, that's a, they're going to paint what's around them, mm -hmm. you know, and the real life of the real people who are around them. And certainly, especially at the beginning, that could be their family, right. you know, but it could be also the people on the street, their street, uh, people at work. And certainly in the 30s, this was a, a big theme, right? People at work. Um, and I would say... You know, whether they were dancers and Moses' wife, my grandmother was a dancer, a uh, modern dancer. So dancers are also workers, you know, just like artists are workers. Absolutely. And that's why they were on the WPA, because they needed a job. Um, writers were workers and there was a WPA art project, but dancers are also workers. So they, they painted people at um, dancers at work. Of course, this echoes like Degas also, so it's part yes, of like yes, Western yes. civilization and stuff like that. But, um, uh, you know, they painted people on the street coming from work, uh, women and men coming from work, also seamstresses, uh, um, laundresses, uh, ordinary kinds of people. Some of these people were Jewish um, and some of the scenes were in Jewish neighborhoods. And so there are occasionally um, kind of explicitly Jewish moments where there appears, let's say, Yiddish writing or something like this. Uh, but mostly it's not, um, at least not explicitly. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's they, I think, thought of New York as their homeland. 
right? And so that's what they painted. They painted their homeland. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, that really segues nicely into kind of, uh, and I may tie in kind of these two questions that, you know, being engaged in social realism, um, certainly observing and documenting what was around them, um, demonstrating empathy for the struggles of, of the working class. Um, and as you aptly mentioned, the art scene in New York, the urban society, everyday life, their families, middle class Jewish life were frequent themes. Um, I just want to, because this is clearly demonstrated, you know, in in some of the subjects of, of their works. But I just wanted to read this. Uh, this is a, a short excerpt from uh, a memoir that was written by your dad, David Sawyer, describing his father's studio, so Moses's studio, during the Depression years when Moses was in his mid-30s. So his earliest memories of this time, he says, no money, no studio, and Moses worked at home. It was a tiny apartment in Greenwich Village with two small rooms and a bathroom, which also contained a kitchen stove. The living room was dominated by a double bed, a heavy oak table, and an easel. The little apartment was always crowded. All were artists one of one sort or another, or so they thought. Painters, poets, poets, actresses, and dancers. Um, and it, you know, they, it kind of really reflects the, this bohemian lifestyle that was kind of nurtured by the depression, with people kind of huddling together, you know, to to gain warmth, but also you know, and sustenance from one another, but also sharing ideas and spaces, which is kind of I think a great opportunity. Do you want to maybe pull up your your PowerPoint that you know you've got a couple of great images there in terms of you know what they were documenting and depicting. Um, can you see that? We cannot. We cannot see that. Share. Okay. Another button. No. Share this. If not, then we should go on. I think I have it pulled. Uh, oh, okay. So let's do this. Um, Okay. So this is. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's start here. Uh, okay, so this is on the WPA, right? So this is uh, Moses. So yeah, I think you mentioned, so this is Granite. They lived in Greenwich Village. I think it was very exciting. Uh, they were poor, but, in, you know, this was kind of bohemian poverty. This was not like, uh, you know, uh, unemployed working class poverty in the 1930s. Uh, and um, I think it was it was very very exciting time. Uh, they were very left wing. They were communists uh, by that time, um, and you know the communists did have influence in the WPA. Um, but but by the time the WPA was around in the second half of the 1930s, the communist line it was the period of the Popular Front. So there was. It wasn't so radical, really. It was really more emphasizing, expressing the life of the people, right, in a kind of general, very vague kind of way. So here you have um, Moses, one of Moses' works, uh, uh, which is artist in the WPA, which, which just shows, um, you know, artists working in a studio uh, on canvases, which appear to be um, studies or sections. Uh, for the murals, right? Because of course the murals were like the WPA wanted to do public art, and a lot of that was expressed through murals. But uh, you see here they're working on on these scenes, and if you go to the next slide, uh, here's a great great kind of photograph of them. So on the on the left is Moses with the suspenders uh, and assistants, and they are working on this mural which they did for a Brooklyn hospital. And um, you see him working with the child, this old, like children at play and so on. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that this is, this is a little portion. This was the section that Moses was working on painting. Okay. But it says here, 
the Smithsonian, it says oil on canvas. So this was on canvas, and I guess later transferred or you know, repainted on onto the mural. So these this photograph and the paintings are, are kind of interesting about the process there. Um, Should we go to uh, the next piece okay, here? Or the next one. So we were talking about the family. Yeah. So a little earlier, since so 1926, before the WPA, before the Depression. So this is in the family living room, you know, and it's the members of the family. Um, uh, it's uh, sister Rebecca, uh, known as Rebbe, uh, in the family teaching Moses how to dance. I love uh, this. And sitting in the background are their mother, Bela, reading the, the Tog, the Yiddish newspaper. Um, yes. Uh, their brother, Israel, who's playing the harmonica for them. Uh, their father, Avram, who's washing his arms, folded, looking, I don't know, amused. And uh, in the corner there, another figure is Dibaba Doba, grandmother Doba who must have been Bela's mother, because otherwise I've actually never heard much about her. Uh, but I assume it's Bela's mother. Uh, there's a lithograph of this in which she's actually kind of not there, she's kind of cropped out. But this is the painting. Um, and this painting, things we were talking about before, has somehow become you know, seen as representative of the whole immigrant experience. It's in Irving Howe's World War Fathers, it's on the cover of my camera. There it is. This thing from the Jewish Museum in New York from about 20 years ago. Um, Whoop, you're, you're kind of come back to the microphone a little bit there. Whoop. You yeah, we're losing your uh, audio. Oh. There we go. Now I can hear you again. All right. So I'll, I'll have it like this. This was a catalog from the Jewish Museum about painting about Jewish artists in New York, uh, where uh, it's on the cover. Uh, it's in a cover of other books, other books, uh, and people read all kinds of things into it. I, I'm not sure how much of it is valid. Uh, of course, it, it does have the Yiddish writing in it, so it's like very it's kind of explicitly Jewish scene. Uh, but um, you know, whether it's about kind of immigrants uh, ill at ease or it's about younger people becoming at ease mm -hmm. in America while their parents are ill at ease. Yes. Uh, all of these things, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, one, one, next, one interpretation says, well, they're, they're more traditional parents, but of course their parents were not traditional uh, as we talked about before. Right. But they are older and they're old worlds, you know, so, you know, you can read into it a lot of different things, but it certainly is an interesting um, kind of interior, you know, scene of a Bronx uh, home in the 1920s. So interesting. And, and one of the wonderful things about it are all the things that you can read into it, uh, you know, depending on what your background experience. Um, so it's a, a great piece. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing here. I think. Okay, we are back, and we just are, we have a just two more questions I, I'd like to ask. So we know that in 1939, twins Moses and Rayfield were worked together at the WPA uh, under the Federal Arts Project. They created together a mural at King's Sessing Station Post Office in Philadelphia, and younger brother Isaac actually taught classes under the WPA FAP and but you know these activities really just reflect a small portion of the brothers long and, and very impactful career in a number of mediums what would you say is their legacy uh so this is the hardest question uh for me to answer i'm not an art historian so um in those terms i i'm not not necessarily qualified to answer but I think that you know it would be be nice if their message was taken seriously, right? Because they were um, of one generation, and then shortly after them came you know came the um, abstract expressionists, right? And this was kind of the enemy to them. Matt like Rayfield for a while was a an editor of a journal called Reality, and uh, they were militant um, figuratist re realists. And um, you know, without 
value judgment on any other school of art. I think maybe to look at them and look at uh, artists like them and look at their work and, and, and think about how they were kind of bringing out um, something, again, in, in real life, not just figures and forms, but but expressing something about the, the, the life of the people that lived around them uh, in their time and their place. So I think that that may be, um, you know, their, their most important legacy. And someone said, you know, that an artist, the job of an artist is to see things that other people don't see, you know, and, and to bring it out there. But the thing is, it doesn't have to be abstract. No, that, right. No. It can be actually like the, the figure to the realistic kind of image that they're bringing something out of it that other people don't see. And I think that they, they were able to do that. And I hope that that may be, maybe that's their, their, their legacy. Well, I, I would have to agree as, as someone who has long been a, a fan of their work and we're, you know, feel so lucky to have uh, a number of works by uh, at least two, unfortunately, and none by your grandfather, but um, they, they are really wonderful features in the exhibit. So our last question here, you're a scholar of American immigration, American Jewish history. You've written many books and articles on these topics and have worked on projects pertaining to Yiddish language, literature, culture. Did the experiences of your grandfather and your great uncles influence you academically or influence your path? Uh, yes, although I, I think the way is not, you know, completely direct or, or obvious. Uh, but um, so three of my grandparents were born in the United States, which is pretty, you know, uh, I think probably unusual for someone my age in New York, um, Jewish person my age in New York. But my grandfather was born in Russia. And even though he came to the age of 12, that's right. I think even neurologically speaking, that's like on the border when you always have an accent. So even though he spoke English with his family, you know, for the next, you know, six decades or whatever, he always had an accent. And uh, I always kind of thought, you know, I mean, I always felt like he was from somewhere else and I became very interested in that. And uh, just this whole kind of you know, immigrant experience and um, when he came and where he came from, you know, connected me to like, the, 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 the wave of Jewish immigration, right? And just the sense of maybe being something that was just a little bit different from you know, being American, but also being something a little bit different at the same time. Yes. So this led me to, you know, to kind of start studying um, Jewish history and particularly the history of Jewish immigrants. Uh, so I've never, you know, I've mostly written about people who are not really like them particularly, you know, uh, in a lot of ways, but who were like them in, in that they were part of that same mass wave of Jewish immigration, which is where Still to this day, the, the large majority of American Jews, you know, trace their their descent. Um, now, uh, I don't know if I should say this because I'm really just just starting, so don't hold your breath. Okay. But I'm thinking maybe I'm just going to ditch the, all the pretense, you know, and actually write a kind of history of the family, or really going to be a history of transitions in Jewish life, as we said, from traditional Jewish life to kind of this modern. Jewish, Yiddish, and Hebrew culture, to art, to left-wing politics, and ultimately to kind of a certain kind of urban, you know, liberal America, uh, cosmopolitan American culture, you know. Um, so we'll see how long that's going to take <laughs> if I have enough time. Left, we'll, see. <laughs> well, that sounds absolutely amazing and like something we should all be looking forward to. Uh, you know, how, how lucky we are and how much we've all already benefited as a society from your family's contributions and from your contributions. So thank you so much. It has been a pleasure talking with you, um, getting insights into your family. This has is, is just been wonderful. So thanks to everyone for joining us. Be sure to come in and see the Brother Can You Spare a Dime, Jewish Artist of the WPA exhibit, which will be on display through September 5th. Thanks so much and have a great rest of the day.